recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends on Horses! Today we are joined by our very own Emma Kelson. Emma is a canine and equine body worker with a wealth of knowledge of biomechanics. Recently, Emma became certified as an equine behavior consultant. We're excited to dive deeper into these topics with Emma today. Yay! <laughs> Um, so for those of you who don't know, Emma and I have actually known each other um, since we were 12 years old, so I feel like I've had the privilege of just a um, sideline seat of watching your um, pretty inspiring journey with horses. Um, but I thought that we could kind of start back at the beginning um, before getting into kind of the meat and potatoes of the interview. And um, I wonder if you could share with us just when you fell in love with horses. Absolutely. So uh, horses for me started, I would say I was about nine years old. Um, and I went on a school field trip to a, um, to a farm. And I fell in love with a, um, with a stallion while I was at that farm. And I obsessed with that stallion so much as a nine year old, I bought myself a little um, like a little replica of the stallion and I had it intended on one day rescuing the stallion. The stallion was totally fine, but I thought that the stallion would be better off with me. So um, I told my mom that I was desperate for a horse and she said, well, uh, if you can have one, if you can pay for it. And I got a paper route <laughs> and uh, I don't think she was hoping for this outcome, but it took me two years between my paper route and busking um, in front of churches on Sundays and, uh, and selling jewelry door to door as a nine to 12 year old to be able to save up enough money for my first horse. And then after that, it was just, you know, I had to keep my paper route because I had to be able to pay for board for myself. And my, um, at the time we lived in town and so we didn't have any property. So I used to go out to um, a little farm where I kept my horse and some of our listeners who are local will know um, Morgan Gladish is um, a local boarder and uh, he was the first person I kept my horses with. And it just evolved from there. The passion was there and as it happens with other people, the bug was set and the virus was a forever, it was a disease and it still is today. I have not kicked it yet. <laughs> and so throughout our youth, um, you and I spent a lot of time at pony clubs, at horse shows. Um, when did you first um, start becoming interested in body work? Oh, so that's a great question. Um, so outside of, I knew I wanted to do something with horses. Uh, what I thought I wanted to do was um, coach and compete. And I ended up going to Germany straight out, straight out of high school and working at a few barns out there, working and riding um, at some pretty high level barns. My focus was, I was hoping more to become a dressage rider. And one thing that I found while I was there was that a lot of these horses, and it's interesting because both of these paths, they're between my behavior work as well as my body work are linked up. So, I was noticing a lot of behavioral problems in these horses, in a lot of these high-end horses that I was working around in Germany. And um, they were treating these behavior problems like they were attitude problems, mm. I would say. And um, with m what I felt was that they, we should be looking at these problems first, um, as physical problems. Let's rule. If you're having an issue with a horse and it keeps re reoccurring and they keep trying the same methods and it's not working to work it through it uh, through training, then what should be the next step would be maybe look at the horse's body as the horse in pain, um, especially these really well trained horses who really understood their cues. Um, it seemed odd to me that they would still be having these behavioral problems with them. So then that led me down the route of being a little bit more interested in, in body work over, over um, competition and coaching. 
um, because I wanted to have a positive impact on these horses and um, maybe, yeah, help with some of these problems that were being overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, so I came back to Canada and shortly thereafter, I went and became a certified body worker. Um, the focus being mostly on uh, equine and canine uh, chiropractic work, so spinal alignment stuff, and some massage and pressure point release work. Um, so that was the first thing that I did. And then shortly thereafter, I was um, getting a little bit busier, and I had some clients that I really was struggling with because I found that I would give their horses temporary relief, but um, I wasn't solving the problem. And for me, the goal was to, uh, as I said in another podcast, um, see my home, even though it's bad for business, I want to see my clients less often. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. then you know the work that you're doing is working. And that just wasn't happening with some particular clients. Um, and so I went down the route of looking at some other forms of body work to accompany what I was doing because the whole body works together. You know, you, um, uh, your spine affects how your nerves function. Your fascia affects how your spine moves and how the rest of the tissues in your body move. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I have a, my favorite body worker. I'll go and go, ah, my ankle's really bothering me today. And she'll go, oh, got to work on your neck. <laughs> mm -hmm. So really learning about the body as a whole system and being able to treat, um, treat the body as such rather than just looking at the spine, right? Or just uh, pressure point release work. So, so it really pushed me down that journey of um, applying some new skills to my body work. Um, and that, you know, so I've, I learned some active release technique. Um, I learned some myofascial release work. Um, I'm learning uh, just this last year more about nerve mobilization, which is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, basics of massage. And, and then another big piece of that came to me when I started, so um, to supplement my income when I was trying to become a full-time body worker, I became a certified group fitness instructor and personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> For humans. <laughs> For humans, yeah. <laughs> um, and I did a lot of that in Vancouver when I lived there. And that was, gave me more perspective. So then I went, okay, so I can work on their bodies, um, the animals' bodies, not the human bodies. <laughs> um, and uh, I can put all of these pieces together and sometimes that's it. But then we also have old patterns just like we have in our own bodies. Mm -hmm. So we need to make new patterns of movement. Okay, so how do I make new patterns of movement to support the body work? So I took that and then I started um, learning even more about equine and canine and other animal mechanics and um, started providing clients with exercises and programs to support the body work and move them closer towards their goals. So again, whole picture, right? You know, mm -hmm. and sometimes, it, sometimes it's not the, um, sometimes it's not the skeletal work, it's the fascia. Sometimes it's not the fascia, it's the, um, muscles or the nerves or or you find out the key component was changing these these uh, patterns of movement um, or none of that works and you go you know what I think that the vet is what this horse needs mm. or a change in career and that can be a really challenging conversation to have with a client is it's like mm -hmm. your your beloved horse that you really want to event on or barrel race with is not maybe it, it isn't the best for that animal's body. So yeah, so there's a lot of pieces to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sounds like quite an intricate system that you're constantly looking to for information to guide you in your practice. Mm -hmm. um, 
just to kind of loop back a little bit, um, for those folks out there um, who don't have as firm of an understanding of biomechanics, I wonder if you can expand um, just kind of the definition of what biomechanics is and why it's important for um, horsey folks to have a good understanding of. Absolutely. So we could really dive into that, but I think that the best the best thing for people to kind of take away is that um, your horse your horse is born uh, with a way of moving, right? Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, their ideal way of moving, and sometimes they don't come out that way because of traumatic birth or what have you, or if they're born with you know um, joint issues or whatever. But let's just say that your horse is born with in an ideal way. Um, what I want to do is I want to maintain that ideal. And we need to look at how your horse is moving today and what affects your horse's movement. So what affects your horse's movement are things like how your horse is put together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so confirmation, but also um, muscle, um, muscle balance, you know, how have you been riding your horse? That's going to affect how your horse moves. If you've been riding your horse with its head up high and its back arched, then those top line muscles are going to be short and tight. That's going to affect how your horse moves. That's going to affect its mechanics. So when we're looking at biomechanics, there are a lot of different pieces that a practitioner needs to look at. But for the average person, I would say that riding your horse, riding your horse correctly and understanding that how they're moving will impact how they're developing mm -hmm. and the wear and tear on their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that that's probably a good, a good baseline to, to think about when we're thinking about our horse's mechanics. Okay, how are we, and then how are we helping them move? Can we, can we help them move better? Can we improve what we're doing to help how their, how their mechanics are affected to get them back or closer to that perfect baseline, whatever their baseline is? Yeah. And so you recently became certified as a behavior consultant. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you can just talk to our listeners a bit more about what brought you specifically to behavior consulting. Okay, so the behavior, oh man, it's all linked together. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that when I was in Germany, I saw some behavior issues, right? So I wanted to go about that, working at it from a bodywork perspective. I guess I'm always interested in the piece that people aren't seeing. Um, um, I might just um, get you to elaborate a little bit because I think um, a lot of the times when people think we you know, I'm in need of a behavior consultant. They're thinking of the horse that's jumping fences, can't be contained. Um, of course, you know, that's not always the case. Um, so in terms of the behaviors that you were seeing, um, what did those, what did those look like? Um, absolutely. So, um, and I think I'm going to elaborate on two things there. Uh, so behavioral issues, that might range from what you just mentioned, so the bigger problems, um, or it could be needle phobias, right? Phobias of getting an injection. Mm -hmm. um, that a behavior issue might be, I won't go up to the mounting block. Um, it could be uh, a horse that is resource guarding, so a horse that won't allow other horses near food or water or their friends. Mm -hmm. um, it could be so, a horse who's aggressive towards the farrier. Um, and then when I'm saying, when I'm, I'm kind of labeling horses here, you know, um, aggressive or fearful, but as a behavior consultant, um, I'm looking at the function of their, their behavior, mm -hmm. right? So a client might contact me and go, my horse is uh, resource guarding or my horse is aggressive towards other horses around water and won't let the other horses drink and I have to go um, instead of how can I just how can I train this horse out of this 
I have to take that information and go, what's the function of their behavior? Why are they behaving this way? Um, often that requires a vet visit. Um, sometimes that I have to go, okay, so what they want to do is they want the horse to move away from their, their water source. What they want is the water. How can I fulfill their, their desire uh, while creating a situation that will solve the problem for the owners and the other horses? Oh, sorry, I kind of took us away from your original question. Um, well, it's perfect, because you're really pointing to that spectrum of behavior um, that can be supported um, by the work that you do versus I think, you know, when we think of a behavior consultant, we think um, of those horses that um, everyone is just stuck with. But I love that you touched on even just simple little pieces like not standing at the mounting block, um, because really I think, you know, we all have um, aspects of our relationship with our horses that we're constantly working on and constantly working to improve and so I love that you spoke to that spectrum. Oh, well my pleasure. Um, it's kind of it's an interesting thing because uh, people don't always know when to contact a behavior consultant as well. Uh, I would say that if you have a really good trainer so what trainers do uh, really well or good trainers do really well is that they teach horses um, cues for behavior, right? So they'll teach a horse how to go and they'll teach a horse how to stop and then uh, they, they can do their own behavior modification and just clarifying cues. Often horses aren't behaving because they don't fully understand what the rider wants, right? Mm -hmm. When it moves into calling a behavior consultant, behavior consultants really look at the science of behavior, mm -hmm. the, the, the whys. Uh, how to take apart a horse's story and um, and use the past and current information to pull apart what they're needing and why they're behaving the way that they are. Uh, whereas training is um, clarifying clarifying cues, really making sure that horses understand on that basic level, but sometimes it goes beyond that. Sometimes there is real trauma that you have to work through and you and you're not just trying to get a behavior, you're actually trying to change a horse's emotions about a behavior. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how might you as a behavior consultant um, work to creating those changes? So uh, what I do is I start off with an assessment, right? So I want to gather all of that really, really important information. But I would say that the most important piece is um, beyond even what my clients are telling me, is assessing the needs of the horse. Mm, okay. So I want to look at not only the horse's environment, right? Is there something that they're lacking or something that they're wanting there? But really, what's the function of their behavior? Like I said, like kind of like I said before. So um, in creating, in changing behavior, and a lot of people can do this too if you kind of switch your mindset, is uh, what is the function of my horse's behavior and why is my horse's behavior continuing? in this way. So obviously they're fulfilling a function by behaving in this undesirable way. And if, how can I fulfill that function, right? So how can I fulfill that function so that they feel filled up um, in a way that isn't going to damage the relationship with their owner and keep them and other animals safe? Mm -hmm. And then then it gets a little bit more complicated. You have to choose a route to do that. And there's lots of different um, possibilities depending on what your problem is. And so, I st so often it start by fulfill their function and then use techniques like systematic desensitization um, or counter conditioning or all these words that we could, we could get into, but to change how they feel about the specific issue. So let's say, uh, so my horse Sterling, who we've talked about a lot in the podcast, um, because he's such a character. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly is. Yeah. Um, he got really dog aggressive. He got like, you know, kill a dog, dog aggressive. So um, what I did was I employed some of my dear animal loving friends to come over to help me, or dog owning friends, um, to come over and help me work through some of his dog behavior issues because I couldn't have him 
um, I couldn't have him going after a dog while I'm leading him down the road, right? Mm -hmm. um, not only do I feel bad for those dogs, but also that lands me in potential danger as well, because he's mm -hmm. a big horse with big feels, and, um, and yeah, I could get hurt in that process. So uh, here is how I work through his dog behavior it, problem. So my friends would come over with their dogs, um, my, I would go, okay, what's the function of his behavior? He wants to create distance between himself and those dogs. Oh, interesting. Right? So what I would do is I would have, hold my beloved horse, or actually in the very beginning, I let him be free so he could create distance himself if he needed to. Um, but there was a fence between him and the others. So I would have the, the other dogs start to approach us. He would notice them, but I wouldn't want him to have a fear response because the more an animal practices a response, the more you're going to see it. So once he notices the dog, I would get them to turn around and walk away. Mm. So we're fulfilling the need for distance from the dog. Okay. okay. And I played with that a few different ways. Sometimes I would, they would stay still and I would walk towards the dog and then walk away. Once he became really comfortable with that routine and we worked it with varying distances and we worked it with um, the dogs doing different things too because I wanna make sure that no matter what that dog is doing when I'm out on the road, he's gonna be okay. If the dog's being goofy or barky or runny or just standing or quiet or hanging out behind a tree, I want my horse to be okay. Mm -hmm. Because horses are very context specific. So if, uh, you know, if you have your horse has learned to be okay with dogs sitting 10 feet away beside your barn, and then you expect them to be just as okay when you take them out on the road, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> So then what I started doing, so we, we generalized the behavior somewhat, but also I started reinforcing him later when the dogs would approach so that he would start expecting, okay, dog shows up. I get it. I get happy because, and I'm using labels here, but it's the best way to describe it. I get happy because I'm getting cookies or scratches or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? So first I fulfilled the behavior and then I... Um, change the emotion around the stimuli, the stimuli being the dog. So then he started seeing dogs and having, hopefully, and I can't see into his brain, warm feels. <laughs> uh -huh. Right? Now, I, to, to let you know the effectiveness of that particular example, um, we have a neighbor dog, and we've got a bit of a neighbor dog problem around here. They all come onto the property, which is why he started the aggression in the first place. Mm -hmm. It was a chasing and biting issue. Um, but we have a very sweet neighbor dog who, over the last two months, has started coming over whenever his uh, human mom is not around. Mm -hmm. And um, Sterling and him groom each other now. Wow. Yeah. So, and in fact, yesterday they were rolling in the same roll patches. They were grooming each other. Sterling will stand over and kind of nibble at his, the dog's back and the dog will jump up and nibble at his neck and his cheeks and his ears and Sterling Aww. will scratch his ears on the dog. Um, and then the dog will run around and have zoomies because the dog is so pumped and Sterling will roll around and zoomie with him. And, and so that is a complete turnaround for a horse who would lunge at bite and stomp dogs previously mm -hmm. and that was taking slow consistent measures not punishing him right because punishing him for um for having bad feelings about dogs in that particular circumstance would only increase his negative feelings around dogs right yeah. and sometimes sometimes that works but as a behavior consultant, what my responsibility is, is to not just have a procedure work, but I also want to change how the horse feels about the situation. Mm -hmm. I'm not just looking for behavior. I'm also looking for a change in how they feel. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so in terms of how behavior, you know, changing behavior works, that's a basic 
example, it's complicated because we have every horse is a snowflake. We need to look at them all individually and differently. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, fulfill the function, change the emotion. Mm. Yeah. And so, I mean, from that example, um, it sounds like you have to have a very firm understanding as a behavior consultant of how horses learn, how they're not only um, learning information for the first time, but how that learning happens over time, especially when you're addressing um, a behavior um, and, you know, maybe a situation that they already have um, created a bit of a theory around. <laughs> Um, so I wonder, um, are you able to expand for our listeners, just even if it's a brief synopsis of just how, how do horses learn? Oh, man, uh, we could talk for six hours about how horses learn. Uh, but yes, some basics. So, um, uh, oh, goodness, where to start here? Um, okay, so let's get into the four quadrants and the four quadrants get talked about a ton and probably too much, but really it's the basics that if I'm teaching a group class or doing a lecture, um, that that's where we start for that basic, basic knowledge. So, um, there is positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, mm -hmm. positive punishment and negative punishment. Now there's a stigma around, uh, the word negative reinforcement, that's a bit unfair. Uh, in learning theory, in learning science, and behavior consultants are really, we're, you know, it's science, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, negative and positive don't have anything to do with emotion. Okay. So, I think that's a really important distinction for people to make. Um, because you're right, um, there is a lot of best, bad press out there for negative reinforcement or negative punishment. Yes, exactly. So negative, you're thinking math. <laughs> um, negative is just subtraction. So negative reinforcement is subtracting a stimuli in order to increase the likelihood of something happening again. So to make that example really clear, um, good natural horsemanship people, trainers, are using negative reinforcement. When people are saying pressure and release methods, mm -hmm. all that is is negative reinforcement. Okay. So that is the system that you're working with when you're working with natural horsemanship. It's just the release of pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for something to happen again. And, and then we hear a lot of natural horsemanship people talk about horses learning from that release. Exactly, exactly. And that release is just one of those quadrants doing their work. And remember that negative reinforcement increases behavior, mm -hmm. right? Um, punishments decrease behavior. So if you're, if you're training your horse, and your horse um, to, to do something, let's say move around you in a circle, um, and your horse does it the next time you ask it to, that's because you're using one of the two reinforcement quadrants. Okay. Because reinforcement increases behavior. If your horse is, um, if you're trying to get your horse to move around you in a circle, and it doesn't do it the next time you go to, to uh, make your horse move in a circle around you, um, there is a possibility, uh, it's very likely, that somehow you are using one of the punishment quadrants because punishment eliminates behavior, reinforcement increases behavior. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, I mean, we've got the positive and negative. So, uh, obviously, um, positive reinforcement is you're adding something to a situation to increase behavior. And um, something that a horse likes, like cookies or scratches or play, or it could be proximity to another horse. They want to hang out with another horse. That's positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, there's myths around in the horse industry just because of lack of understanding that positive reinforcement is just putting cookies in your horse's mouth. Uh, so mm -hmm. a lot of people avoid positive reinforcement. But in fact, any time that you are adding something pleasant, something desirable that reinforces their behavior, regardless of what it is, 
if your horse finds it reinforcing and you're adding it, it's positive reinforcement. Okay. Yeah. Um, then you've got our negative punishment, which again, you know, subtraction is negative, not negative feels. So taking something away, um, something I see people do a lot is they'll walk up to their horse's pen with their mash bucket. The horse will come and, you know, ears pinned, looking forward and pushy. Um, so then they will move away and take the mash bucket away. Mm -hmm. Right. And they'll wait for the horse's behavior to change. That's a good example of negative punishment. They're taking something away in order to change behavior or to yeah. eliminate the grouchy face. Yeah. Right? Uh, positive punishment would be adding something in order to punish, to eliminate behavior. So that would be like, you know, giving your horse a smack or, um, yeah, so adding something, right? Yeah. Now, those are the four basic ways that horses learn in terms of the four quadrants. Um, but we also want to think as a behavior consultant, it does get more complex than that. We want to look at what affects learning. And okay. that's, that's where your good behavior consultants, um, that's what, what the difference is between just, you know, your average show and your good consultant. So uh, what affects your horse's learning? And there are some surprising things that affect horse learning. So um, things like, uh, let's see here, there was a study done that looked at horse head shape. Um, and, uh, and I apologize to any of my dear friends because I think this stuff is so super cool. So you'll probably have heard me talk about this again uh, or before. Um, uh, <laughs> Horse head shape, so the skull shape of the horse and the ganglion cell, the cell distribution in the horse's eye, which affects their monocular and binocular vision. So actually how they see their periphery as well as their, their, their vision right in front of their face. So, let, so horses like Arabians, um, they are more likely to, because of their head shape to have a shorter peripheral field. Uh -huh. Aha, so your Arabians, and this is simplifying things a bit, but are more likely to be to spook at things in their periphery, or in general, quite possibly, because their vision isn't as good, and um, they are prey animals, right? Hmm. Uh, Fascinating. It is really interesting. So, and then your horses with, um, without such a narrow face or dished face um, often have a better periphery. And to horses, their periphery is really, really important because that's what makes, helps them feel safe, right? right? So maybe when we're training and looking at changing behavior in horses and just training horses, we might want to look at spending more time desensitizing your Arabians to what's going on in their periphery than you would your draft horse. Right. Right. So things like confirmation can affect behavior and the choices your horses make. Genetics can affect behavior. Um, and then there are all those other things like environment, learning history, um, tons and tons of things affect how your horses learn, how they react to stimuli will affect what is positively reinforcing or negatively reinforcing what they find punishing. Um, so there's a whole list of things that can impact how they see the world around them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm curious, because I was actually talking um, to someone about this the other day. Mm -hmm. um, do you have like a window that you kind of have in your mind of, okay, I've introduced um, something new um, and, you know, how long on average would you find it would take for a horse to learn um, what you're trying to teach them? Oh, okay. So if you've got a horse with, um, with a, oh man. Okay. So that's an interesting question because it's very specific to the horse. Okay. It's, it's very specific to their learning history. Um, if you have a horse, let's say you have a horse that you're trying to introduce to an umbrella opening, just mm -hmm. as an example. Okay. So Again, that might be different depending on your horse's breed, right? And we know now that uh, when you're looking at breeding uh, horses, you can be breeding for behavioral tendencies, but you know, 
uh, different lines will have different um, uh, tendencies towards certain behaviors. Some lines might be bolder, some might be spookier, some might be more athletic. It's all the, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, that plays a role. Now, if your horse has a negative learning history with tarps, then it might be a little bit, uh, take them a little bit lo longer to be okay with an umbrella opening, right? Because the things are kind of similar. If your horse has no learning history with anything umbrella-like, and you introduce it in a really kind of in a in a in a really thoughtful way, your horse isn't going over threshold. You're you're you know being kind and going through those slow steps, whether you're using positive or negative reinforcement. You still have to think about this you know this process. Um, then our horses can learn quite quickly. They're really smart, right? Mm -hmm. Really smart. Well, and in this specific example that I'm thinking about, um, it was uh, my gelding. I've had him on mash for the winter, mm -hmm. and because um, he's he's getting a little older, and my younger mare um, does not need to be in, on mash anymore. She was a little bit for the winter, but of course she's starting to balloon as the weather kind of gets a little bit warmer, and she's not burning as many calories. Um, so I switched up the routine where I was bringing out two mash buckets. I started just bringing out the one and I was separating them. And it took them about three days of knowing that the routine had switched before she wouldn't even come to the gate anymore. My gelding would go, oh, you know, it's 5.30. She usually comes out now and he'd move himself into the other paddock and he'd be waiting for me to bring the mash. Um, yeah. So, and it did kind of um, just spark a conversation with another kind of friend who's also into horses of just how long did that learning take? And that was um, a situation where I wasn't necessarily um, introducing something new. It was more of a change in routine, but it was something where the horses were going through that learning process. Ooh, um, that's a great example. Our horses are, uh, are, are very routine dependent. Mm -hmm. And especially, I would say, in captivity, um, routine can be a great way of reducing stress and anxiety in horses. So our horses can very much depend on routine. If I'm working with a horse that has high anxiety, I might make sure that I have some good, just like humans, right? Mm -hmm. Structure and routine um, to help them reduce their anxiety. So yes, our horses are great fast learners, but once they have a routine down or there's learning history there, it can take a while for them to switch gears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's actually a really that's a really good example because yeah, it can it can take it can take some time now um, One thing that can change the amount of time they take is how reinforcing positive or negative they find that new situation right if yeah. if, a, if a if a situation's super super reinforcing then that might override a little bit faster What's going on in their brains? Uh -huh. that old routine and that old pattern so one of the things that I found really neat to watch just as your friend watching you go through this journey is just how much um, your new behavioral consultant there is actually overlapping um, with your body work and your biomechanics. And I'm just, I'm wondering if you can share with our listeners a little bit of just how those two have really come together for you and how you're noticing um, them change your practice. Oh, for sure. It's huge. Um, they both interplay a lot. I, I'm so, I feel so fortunate that I have the experience in both of those worlds. Um, I have, I have clients that couldn't have body workers work on their, their horses or dogs because of aggression issues or fear issues. Dogs more often aggression issues, horses more often fear issues. Um, uh, and just with a little bit of basic learning knowledge, learning theory knowledge, and, and uh, an understanding of how behavior works, um, I can work on those animals. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel really lucky. So um, here's a, a little story. I've got an equine client that I started doing body work on about a year and a half ago. And when I first showed up, the horse couldn't be caught. Um, then you'd finally get the horse caught and the horse would be really panicky when restrained, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
but it felt very necessary to do body work on this horse. The horse had some bigger body issues happening. So, um, reinf so uh, let me think here. What's a good way to put it? Um, choice and control are, are reinforcers to animals. Okay. So I just did a presentation on choice and control and uh, in, in Florida. So it's a, it is a current close to my heart issue. So I'm more than happy to blabber on about it. Um, well, and I wonder too, if we may even just kind of go a little bit deeper into that. Um, because I don't know if a lot of listeners would understand what you mean, even just by um, kind of those two terms. So if you wouldn't mind just even going down that rabbit hole for a minute. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, yes, please. Give me the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, control over your environment is biologically imperative to survival, especially as prey animals. So a baby horse comes out into the new world. It needs to be able to control its environment quickly and make choices or it could get eaten, right? Yeah. So it has to be able to quickly choose to get up, it has to be able to eat, it has to be able to drink, it has to be able to move quickly um, in fairly short order. So, um, so it is, control is biologically imperative to survival. Okay, so thinking about how big that is, can, be, can you imagine a world where you couldn't control your environment? Mm. That feels pretty scary. And that is anxiety inducing for a lot of humans. I know that when I feel the most anxiety or the most, or have felt the most traumatized in my life is when I felt the most out of control. Right. Again, biologically imperative to survival. So the feeling of control is a very, very powerful reinforcer. And in behavior, we have something that's called primary reinforcers. So primary reinforcers are biologically driven reinforcers, things like food and water, the ability to reproduce, um, air, oxygen is a primary reinforcer because it's all biological. Control is also a biological reinforcer. So just by giving your horse control, you can be reinforcing behavior. And if you remember, positive is adding. So we're adding control to a training program to help behaviors repeat again, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one thing why liberty, or one reason why liberty training can be so powerful when done correctly and done well and ethically is because you're giving your horse choice to interact, right? They can choose whether or not they're gonna be there, whether or not they're gonna work with you, and by giving them choices to control a situation, you're giving them control as that reinforcer, which because it's a biological reinforcer, it's so much more powerful than a lot of other reinforcers are. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's, I, I, I go totally nerdy when I'm talking about this stuff. I love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here's an example of one thing that I do with my canine clients. That's a simple example that people might appreciate. So um, I've been lucky enough not, I've been doing body work for 11-ish years now. Um, I've not been bitten yet and I should knock on wood because I'm sure it's going to happen eventually. Um, however, I have a system where I let the animal control the appointment. Okay. Okay. So what does that look like? So what that looks like is I will be working on, let's say working on a dog, um, and my hands will be on the dog, and my hands might surprise the dog, and the dog will look back. My hands come off. Okay. Then the dog looks forward at the person, and my hands go on the dog again. Soon, that dog, after a few repetitions of that, learns that head back, hands off, heads, head forward, hands on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can control when body work starts and stops. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So because the animal can, is, can make choices, it can control what I'm doing and control reinforces behavior, that animal is way more likely to stick around for body work than if I try to force it. And when I'm try if I try and force it, that can be a really negative experience for the animal. 
we lose trust and they don't feel in control. And mm -hmm. because control is biologically important, that can be really, really scary. And if I want to be able to come back and work on a, an animal uh, for more than one session, um, I want that animal to be on board with me. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means that they're not 100% pumped about it, but they'll put up a lot more with a lot more if they feel like they've got control over their environment than if they don't. It's kind of like going to the dentist, knowing that you can say stop is really powerful. If I went to the dentist and the dentist uh, went, uh, nope, sorry, we're doing whatever we want to you and you have no control, that might be a little bit scary. <laughs> That's a great example, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so do you have the same approach with horses? Yeah, so I do have the same approach with horses and it's interesting. I find it more challenging with horse owners sometimes Sometimes because there's a stigma around Well, my horse just needs to do it. They need to get used to it And a lot of people don't recognize that if you take the time to be patient with your horse and give them the choice Usually they will actually give you the choice that you want mm. We're afraid to relinquish control because of a couple things. Um, we're afraid to relinquish control because we might not get the answer that we want. And we're afraid to relinquish control because our, um, well, because there's a, a, a bit of an, uh, oh goodness, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there is an expectation from our community to, mm. to be able to control situation. Uh, we don't realize though that relinquishing control and giving a little bit of our con control away will get us closer to our, our goal faster. Mm. Um, so similarly, yes, with horses, um, I would do a head forward or head back, especially with that horse I was talking about earlier. Um, now with that particular horse, I also use positive reinforcement in the, in the way of food because that's what kept that horse around when I was working on it at Liberty. Okay. Um, also that horse for a while, it would turn its head back at me whenever I get closer to its hind end where it had the biggest body issues. So it took a few sessions before I could actually work on the hind end because I needed, if you're going to give your a horse choice, you have to respect its choice. You can't pretend to give it choice and then not because then you break trust. Okay. And, and trust is an imperative part of that new learning process, especially when you're trying to change emotions. Uh huh. Mm hmm. So there's really a lot of ways that this learning is overlapping for you. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. My my body work stuff um, really helps me look for. Um, possible pain, possible you need to see the vet issues in in my behavior clients, and in my um, be in my body work, uh, being able to understand behavior and be patient enough to really listen and look at our at our horses uh, really helps me achieve being able to work on these animals. I'm curious if you have any. Um like you've shared a few case examples, but any really big aha moments um, for you as you were working on animals where something just really clicked? Um, there have been, I would say almost every day there's an aha moment. I am constantly learning and I know that I've got a lot more to learn and I find that really exciting that I'm going, you know, there's the opportunity to learn with every different animal, every different client even teaches me something different. Working with people, I mean, when I'm talking about doing body work on animals and, and behavior work on animals, um, you know, we're talking just about the animals, but there is a whole different kind of, if you're going to work with animals, you're going to work with people too. And learning how to communicate with people, especially with um, these more serious situations, like when people are afraid of their, of their horses or afraid for their horse's health, there are a lot of emotions involved. And learning to work with people has been a big kind of aha thing for me throughout the process. Um, learning to be more compassionate, to really listen to people as they're going through these things has been important to being successful. And then with animals, I mean, there's something different every week. A few weeks ago, and I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner, I have a client whose their animal's getting more sensitive to touch as they get older because they have had a lot of, um, 
uh, you know, body work done, being a senior pet. Uh, just something as simple as changing the environment that that happens in can be hugely mm -hmm. powerful. Um, you know, this animal was getting fearful, getting slightly reactive, so trying to bite, you know, wiggling, moving, moving the animal from where it normally gets worked on to a whole different location was a big game changer because again context specific right mm -hmm. so then we went from anxiety because we're in this spot because we're beside the barn to okay i think i can handle this because we're you know halfway down the driveway so thinking not only about what i see right in front of me and working directly with the animal but also looking at environment um, there's all sorts of aha moments in looking at how the, the environment can affect change and that's something that I am constantly trying to pay attention to. And now you also have um, some donkeys um, yeah. that you um, play with often. Um, do you find that there's similarities, differences between how they learn versus how horses learn? Oh, that's a great question. And um, Donkeys are an interesting one because there is less research done on donkeys. I wish that there was more research done on donkeys, so I can't give you a whole bunch of definitive answers in terms of donkeys and learning. However, just from, you know, um, uh, watching my guys, I would say they're incredibly intelligent. Um, a little bit more like if you crossed a donkey or a, a horse and a dog, you'd get a donkey. Um, <laughs> they're playful, grounded, less likely to, uh, and I'm generalizing here because each animal is different depending on their learning history, but um, uh, more likely to assess a situation before reacting than a horse might be. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's say if there's, if I have coyotes come on the property, the horses might book it, whereas the donkeys will stand there, assess the situation, and decide whether or not they should chase the donk or the coyotes versus run away from the coyotes. Hmm. Yeah. And do you feel that that's mostly a temperament piece? Because I know that um, a lot of people use donkeys um, as herd protectors. Yeah. Um, I've seen my donkeys chase, chase uh, coyotes out of the field before. And for any donkey lovers out there like me, <laughs> um, I'm sure you've all seen photos of donkeys holding coyotes in their mouths or cats or stomped on cats or like, you know, they are good. They are definitely good farm protectors. So there is that temperament piece. But I think that uh, one mistake that people make is when they get donkeys, especially as, um, as companions for their horses, is they expect them to be like horses when they're not. Mm. They process things differently. They're really intelligent. Having them just sitting in a field isn't necessarily the best for them. They need stimulation. Um, my donkey, they need uh, buddies and the best buddies for a donkey is another donkey because they play and they process in a similar way. Mm. Um, donkeys get very attached to one another. My donkeys, they will play tug of war. We've got toys out in the field for them. They'll grab their buckets or balls and Sika, my one donkey, will push the ball into Carlos's nose and they will play tug of war back and forth. Um, they're constantly getting into the most fantastic types of trouble. So donkeys need stimulation. They need, um, they're, they're smart, grounded, really super cool animals that are a bit underappreciated. Uh, maybe because they're not as majestic as horses are. But believe me, you get a donkey and, don and uh, you will also become a crazy donkey lady like I am. <laughs> um, and you work on um, clicker training with your animals as well. I do. I'm very passionate about clicker training. Um, I do some clicker training instruction too. Um, and my little donkeys right now are working on their trick titles. So I'm teaching them tricks through clicker training. Um, I've trained my young horse through clicker training. It's something that I really love. So clicker training is generally uh, positive reinforcement. You more often use food or scratching and you use a marker signal like a like a click, like a tongue click, or you can use a physical clicker to mark um, the specific behavior you see, and then they get rewarded for that behavior. And it's been a whole bunch of fun, a major learning curve. It's a whole different language. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll go off on a tangent here for a moment. Absolutely. 
Okay. Um, I certainly, there aren't other people to my knowledge in my area who click or train. So the learning curve for me was large. And when you switch over to clicker training, um, it's like going from English to Cantonese. The methods and mechanics of it all are completely different than your, you know, pressure and release methods, right? Um, so I certainly made a lot of mistakes along the way. And in a way that was a gift though, because when I'm working with my clients now, I've got some horses here that are safe enough, they can work with them and they're clicker savvy horses, but they've got some of these old mistakes um, that they can work through. So that's kind of cool. So the learning curve was hard, but now I am a diehard. <laughs> um, that does not mean that if you have a behavior case for me that I will only put food in your horse's mouth. <laughs> But um, yeah, I, I love clicker training. It is the most fun and just to see the enthusiasm and, um, you know, because the horses are just pumped to be with you and pumped to choose to work with you. It's, uh, it's been a blast. Well, we have covered a lot in this interview. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's many different pieces that we could loop back to. Um, but just before we close, is there anything that we did not touch on that you were hoping to speak to? Um, I don't think so. We touched on body work. We touched on behavior. We touched on their connection. And I think that that's kind of a message that I would like to put out there is that um, whether you're a body worker or you're a horse trainer or behaviorist or, I mean, uh, really, anyone who's working, anyone who owns a horse is a horse trainer, right? You know? Um, we're always, whenever we're interacting with animals, we're always increasing, decreasing behaviors. We're working with them. We're interested in them. Um, but looking at the whole picture is what I'd like people to take away from this podcast, I think. You know, so let's all make sure that when we're working with our horses, we're also looking at how is their body feeling? Mm -hmm. How is their body moving? How, what am I doing that's affecting their body and their movement? What are the long term implications of that? How can I make my, my training clearer? How can I work with their breed and their learning history in a way that's um, minimally invasive and intrusive um, to make sure that their experience with me is the best experience that they can have? So not getting caught in tunnel vision, being open to the whole big picture, and um, being forgiving of yourself and continuing to learn. That would be probably where I'd like to close things up. Mm, it's a beautiful way to close and um, for those people out there um, who'd like to learn more about you and what you do, um, how, how can people find you? Uh, thank you. Uh, my, I've got, you can continue listening to me on Friends on Horses podcast <laughs> <laughs> um, as I interview a variety of guests. Um, and uh, also you can find me on um, Instagram, I think it's, I'm like, is it Emma Kelson horse behaviorist? Something like that will help you find me. Um, and Kelson is spelled K-J-E-L-S-O-N. It's kind of weird. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Emma Kelson horse behaviorist. And uh, I've got my website. Um, it is emmahorsebehaviorconsultant.com. <laughs> so lots of ways to get a hold of me. Uh, I do uh, virtual behavior consulting as well as in-person behavior consulting. So if there's not a consultant in your area and you have a particular issue that you really want to work through, um, feel free to get a hold of me. We can do video conferencing um, and uh, that's a that's a great way to help your animal. Um, lessons, I'm also available for conferences and lectures in body work and behavior and clicker training. So um, yeah, lots of ways to get a hold of me. And yeah, that's, I uh, think about it. Well, is that a wrap, Emma? Oh my goodness, I think that's a wrap. <laughs> If you want more Friends on Horses, you can find us on Facebook at Friends on Horses Podcast. 
Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at friendsonhorsespodcast.com or Instagram at friendsonhorses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hay jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes. Becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon. Or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>